All right. Okay, you only, you only do that because you know how much I enjoy it, so thank you. Uh, Teddy did his research, thank you. He made up half of that, but I appreciate it. It sounded good at least. Hey, it's so great to see you. Uh, I mean that. It's so great to see you all back. I mean, there was a skeleton crew, a few of you worked with physical plant and did a little research, but you know. And you're great people, but don't get me wrong. I like everybody. I want, want, want the crowd here, so uh, good to have you all back. Uh, you know, I, I uh, mentioned that uh, Pastor Bob, you know, we should acknowledge the, the first year students. He said, oh, I'm going to do that. And so, it, you know, when you're new here, when you're a transfer or you're a new freshman, and we ask you to stand, you just, you do what you're told. You know, you go to 8 a.m. classes, you show up for things. It, it fades a little bit. So seniors, I'm, I'm curious how many uh, seniors are, are about to graduate, fifth or sixth year seniors we have. And all I'm going to ask you to do, because this is probably all I could get out of you, just give me one of these. Give me a little head nod. Yeah, and we won't even clap for you. Just, we're glad you're here. That's about all I expect, but, but glad you're here. Good to see you. Good to have you back, and we'll, we'll keep you moving. Uh, first year students, uh, I was with you and with your parents, many of your parents over the weekend, and just you know, warning, if you don't head back home until Thanksgiving, things might be a little different when you get back. Your, uh, your bedroom may be a you know, scrapbooking room, or a craft room, or a sewing room, or a, uh, maybe one of your younger siblings takes it over. Um, you have no authority anymore, so it's, you've relinquished that. Uh, but hopefully you're, you're happy with your new roommate and your new room here. Um, I did tell your parents, um, and, and you can pass this along, upperclassmen as well. Um, you, you know, just a little note to parents, don't believe everything you read on social media. Yeah, it's probably smart in general, but it's particularly about Gordon. Usually the rumors are much more outlandish than the real story. And, um, and so I, they have my email and they're planning to use it. So I, I trust they will. Um, some of you know, if I can get the slide up here. There's our family. I always want to make sure everybody's introduced. Uh, this is a picture we did uh, last spring. Um, I was laughing at something, and there's everybody. Uh, from left to right, Natalie, uh, Evie. Natalie and Evie are in high school. There's me. Becca, who's a new student here. Uh, I don't know if, yeah. You know. I, I'm never going to embarrass her or call her out or mention that her birthday's Friday. And then uh, my wife. Uh, my wife Jennifer, and then Ann, who's in high school, Ellie, who just graduated from college, and Jack. So um, just, you know, I do this so that you know. Um, Jack went to a different college, so, you know, there's a rift uh, between us. <laughs> so, he's so great, he's doing awesome. Just wish he was, you know, at a better college. <laughs> that, that's going to get back to those fields. <laughs> that's the way it is. I one time stood up at Taylor uh, after I'd been named President Gordon and said, Taylor's a great school. It's almost the Gordon of the Midwest. <laughs> it's a good place, but you know. So as we look, we've got this great year ahead. Um, we, we said this last year, and so we're saying it again, and hopefully we mean it, that, you know, that the pandemic's behind us. <laughs> we said this, I mean, almost at the exact same time last year. Pandemic's behind us. We've got nothing to fear. And then everyone was huddling under masks and tests and all this stuff. But we really mean it this time. We really do think so. Uh, just to prove it, um, we tore down Drew Hall over the summer. So, uh, not not that there was anything wrong with Drew Hall. It was a. I mean, this is legitimate. You may have read this in your email. It was a temporary facility built in the 1960s meant to last for a year or two. So we're, we get everything we can out of stuff. Um, but, but yeah, we do have a plan. Don't worry if we have to quarantine, we've got some ways to do that. But um, I am so thankful for even just the way this year has started because we're not as, as you know, uh, fearful about some of those things. And so I thank you, uh, really all of you, even new students, you've all been through this. We've all been through it the last few years. And, and so a lot of what we're, we're doing here um, in, in community is kind of, you know, getting our muscle memory back on how we do things together, how we live together, how we celebrate in a community. And some of that is actually a reset. It's been so long that we've forgotten how we do some things. And so we'll, we'll be talking more about that. Well, today I want to uh, look at a scripture and uh, the theme of, of my message today is guard the good deposit. And I'm drawing that out of this passage in 2 Timothy. 
If you have a Bible, it might be one in front of you. I'd encourage you to take it out because we will be looking at a couple different verses, kind of bouncing around. But I'll, I'll read through it uh, to begin. Uh, for this reason, that verse 5 talks about the faith that, that came to Timothy. Uh, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. And which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Yeah. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. So there's a lot in this first, and we won't dig into every part of it. Uh, in this uh, in this half hour or so we have left, uh, 20 minutes or so. But I just want to point out a, a few things. There's so much here. Uh, it starts with this, uh, this reminder of this faith, a sincere faith, that then says, fan this into flame. It tells us that that, that faith that we have, that, that sort of belief that starts with an assertion about the gospel, about who Jesus is, that is not the end of the story. That can grow. Fan it into flame. And then we're, we're shown that there's there's kind of some, some warning here. We see words like fear and shame and suffering. Uh, don't be ashamed. We, didn't, we don't have a spirit of fear. We'll share in suffering. This tells us that our faith oftentimes will come under criticism. Some of you know what that feels like, to have your faith questioned, or to have people look at you and say, you really believe this stuff. Verse 9 goes on to tell us this is a holy calling, and it's not something that we get because we're just really smart or because we work really hard. You're smart people and you're hardworking people. That doesn't get you there. It's because there was a purpose even before the creation of the world. There was a purpose driven toward this moment. When you'd be reconciled to Jesus, when you'd be reconciled to God. And yet the trick of all this, the hard thing for us, is this idea that it's not indeed by our works. But it's by his purpose and grace, as verse 9 says. How often are we pushing back against God's grace? Because we'd rather do it ourselves. I struggle with that. I think we all must. We're much more content to believe that these are things that we've figured out because we're smart people. Or these are, 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 are practices that we've adopted in our lives because we've got our act together. We've figured out how to be a disciplined person. There's a human desire to maintain control. Ultimately, at the root of that is a lack of belief or a lack of, of really understanding what desperate, sinful people we are. If we truly understand the depth of our sin, if we truly are convicted by that sin, there's no way we can reason our way to God. There's no way we can calculate disciplines or practices that will get us there. We have to lean back on our faith. Living in grace requires us to abandon our own pride. We have to reach that point where we recognize even the, the, the pride that's in us, even the sin of that pride, and only believe that God himself can do this miraculous work in our hearts and that it is a miraculous work, not just an opinion of the day. Tim Keller has called pride the carbon monoxide of sin. It silently and slowly kills you without even knowing. Part of the reason for that is to have pride oftentimes gets you acclaim or praise in the world. Proud people, all of us, oftentimes are successful people. Proud people look like they've got things figured out. Proud people often are the first ones to praise themselves for the good that they do. And that self-promotion often works. But make no mistake, pride is at the root of our own inability to li live in this gift of grace and to walk in this gift of grace in ways 
that will allow the Holy Spirit's work, that good deposit, to continue to grow. Verse 12 goes on, says, I'm not ashamed. I know who I believe. I'm convinced he's able to guard until that day. Jesus is sustaining his salvific work. Jesus is working to maintain that work in our hearts as we yield to his grace, as we yield to him. The language of a good deposit puts us in mind of, uh, of a bank account or something incredibly valuable that will only grow in its worth over time. But note in, in this last verse, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Again, it's not as if we can put a security guard on our heart or we can work diligently to protect that good gift. It's about yielding to the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and this work of grace, this presence of the Holy Spirit who's in us, uh, will continue to pull us toward a place where there's not fear, there's not shame, there's, not, there's uh, bravery in, in the face of suffering. And we live in an age today that distorts the gospel on all sides. Uh, many today say that Christian people are people of hatred. Uh, some people see Christianity as merely a, a, a political tool. Uh, their, their visions of, of God or visions of Christianity uh, that, that look more like a Care Bears cartoon, you know, the god of unicorns and rainbows. He did rainbows. Not sure about the unicorns. So we've adopted at times a, a god that's diminished from who he truly is, from who he really is. Now, this place, Gordon College, has been committed to vibrant Christianity since its founding. Today, we maintain our belief in a living God who intervenes in the world and in our lives in miraculous ways. Now, if that sounds a little overstated, again, I would challenge you on where you really believe you stand in relation to God. Because bridging that gap between our sin and the holiness of our Creator through Jesus' sacrifice and the work of the Holy Spirit is nothing short of a miracle. We believe here at Gordon that all people are created in the image of God and have dignity and worth that must be honored. We believe that our sin is only overcome through Jesus' work. And we believe that because of that work, we're empowered to do great things in the world for his glory. Now, each of us here has uh, signed on to some basics of Christian faith, the statement of faith. You'll find it on the website. And, and it's, it, I won't read through the actual wording of it, but you can look it up later. Just go to gordon.edu and, and type in Statement of Faith. But basically, it's seven assertions that the Bible is our infallible guide in faith and practice, that God is the creator, our preserver. He's infinite, he's eternal, and he's the Trinity, three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Third point tells us that we ourselves, humans, are sinful, that we've fallen. And the only redeeming way uh, for us to get back to God is by the grace of Jesus Christ. Number four tells us more about Jesus, that he was incarnate. He became flesh and dwelt among us. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless death, died on the cross, and was resurrected. Again, if you have trouble with miracles, by point four, you're, you're starting to, to, to not sure what you signed up for. You get to the virgin birth, and all of a sudden you think, wait a second. The resurrection, hold on. If this is merely an intellectual belief, you're not coming along for the ride when we start talking about those wonderful miracles. And it gets better. The work of the Holy Spirit, that the, the, the Spirit of the living God lives in our hearts, continuing to regenerate us, sanctify us, glorify us, and draw us toward ultimate renewal. And that as a Christian, as we live out this life, we are accountable to God. Accountable to God for the way we live our lives and for the way that we proclaim His great news. So that, point seven, we look ahead to the bodily resurrection and the visible return of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a statement that's written, and, and again, if you're a student here, you, you may have read this carefully or you may have read it briefly, but to be at Gordon means that you signed on to this, usually during the uh, admissions process. Uh, and you should know, students, that every employee here, every trustee, goes through that same process. 
of discerning whether this reflects their own personal Christian beliefs. But what does this faith mean in our community? How do we live it out? There are good practices around faith. Uh, some of you, student leaders and, and others, have read The Deeply Formed Life by Rich Fiotas. He talks about practices like prayer, rest, relationship, and work, a balanced life. He draws inspiration from the Benedict uh, monastic order and other monastic orders that separated their day into work and rest and prayer and study. We need a balance of these practices in order to live healthy lives. Some of you know the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a Lutheran pastor who died in a Nazi prison camp just months before the end of World War II. He was in the prison camp because he was part of a plot to assassinate Hitler. In one of his more famous writings, Life Together, he wrote this about Christian community. Christianity means community through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. No Christian community is more or less than this. Whether it be a brief single encounter or the daily fellowship of years, Christian community is only this. We belong to one another, only through and in Jesus Christ. Now this simple concept is actually complicated when you try to live it out. And Bonhoeffer called us to, to practice life together in ways that would draw accountability not only to God himself, but accountability to one another. So how does this play itself out in our community? How are we asking the Holy Spirit to guard our good deposit as we live together in community? There are certainly good practices, disciplines of, of rest, disciplines of meditation on the word of God, disciplines of prayer, Fellowship together, meeting together to encourage one another in our daily struggles, to encourage one another in our growth and spiritual practices. And yes, the practice of chapel. Why do we do chapel? Every time I hear someone describe you know, that we're a Christian college because we go to chapel, my heart breaks a little bit. It's so diminished. Chapel is not what makes us a Christian college. Chapel's evidence of our love for each other and our love for Jesus Christ. We gather together so that we can celebrate that love, so that we can join together as a community that learns from each other, that learns emotionally, socially. Yes, it's a social event that takes on a spiritual dynamic. Just as your church attendance is not a purely spiritual practice, but spiritual and social and emotional whole person events. We are in a community that oftentimes is accused of being very strong, but sometimes pocketed and divided together, or divided out, and not drawn together. This is an amazing opportunity that three times a week we can gather in this room together, hear from each other, worship together, laugh, celebrate. Now, I would agree with anyone, I think we all agree, that the highest form of chapel for students would be no attendance need to be taken, and everyone just shows up. How can you dispute that? What's better than that? I love to show up. I don't know if I've taken attendance. It doesn't matter. And I long for the day when that's the way we'll practice it here at Gordon. And I think that we can get there, but it's going to take some time. It's going to take some time for us to, to, to make sure that this space fulfills our desires and our wants. And it's not just for students. Staff and faculty are here, and they're always welcome. Some staff have a hard time balancing their workload, or they can't clock out and come to chapel. We're trying to work with that. There's a task force that worked on these questions over the summer. We're trying to make sure, especially for you students, but for everyone in the community, when you come into this space, that this is a place where you feel connected to one another and connected to Jesus Christ. As students, as leaders on this campus, this is your space. This will be what you make it. So I, I, I love that we're here today and we're worshiping, and I pray that this will continue, that there'll be enthusiasm. And that by worshiping together, by gathering together, it's part of our, our sense of connected community, that we're holding one another accountable, and that we're also praying together for the Holy Spirit to do this miraculous work in our hearts to guard that good deposit and help it to grow. Another quote from Bonhoeffer's Life Together. Because God has already laid the only foundation of our fellowship, and because God has bound us together in one body with other Christians in Jesus, 
Jesus Christ. Long before we entered into common life with them, we enter into that common life not as demanders, but as thankful recipients. We thank God for what he's done for us. That entering into common life is what happens when we come together on this campus. We share this space, we work in proximity, we breathe the same air, we eat the same food, cheer for the same teams, listen to the same concerts. We share life together. And yet the foundation for making that a transformative experience is rooted in the work of Jesus Christ in our lives. So that idea that we don't come to community demanding our own attention or demanding our way, but thinking of how we can contribute. I think it draws us to think, okay, what are signs of this? Ten signs I've got. You could add to this list. Ten signs that you're asking the Holy Spirit to guard the good deposit and that that's bearing fruit. One, our focus turns away from guarding ourselves. We're guarding that deposit of our reconciliation. We're less concerned with distracting things. Slowly, our focus turns toward others. You'll, you'll, you'll soon decline your own personal demand for your rights and start to look to the, the edification of others. Not focused on the immediate, not afraid to be stretched, not looking for the easiest path for yourself. Your focus on others will manifest in things like evangelism and care, grace and truth. We'll stop living like my story is the only story that matters. And I think one practice is what I would call contemplative prayer with open hands. And I'll end on this. I shared this with some parents over the weekend. But this is a book that's been really uh, meaningful for uh, my wife, Jen, and me. Uh, as we have gone through different changes in our lives and even the changes of starting college. Change is difficult. A lot of you like change. You get bored with routine. You know, I, I would say routine's a little underrated, to be honest. Um, there's good things about routine, about habits and practices that draw us into good, good relationships. But change is hard sometimes. And so I, I think of this often when I go through difficult uh, turmoil or, or challenges in life. Uh, we've lost some parents, we've lost those close to us to death. We've gone through hard times. And I leave you with these words from now on. To pray means to open your hands before God. It means slowly relaxing the tension which squeezes your hands together and accepting your existence with an increasing readiness, not as a possession to defend, but as a gift to receive. Each time you dare to let go and surrender one of those many fears, your hands open a little. Your palms spread out in a gesture of receiving. You must be patient, of course, very patient until your hands are completely open. Thus, a life of prayer is a life with open hands where we're not ashamed of our weakness, but realize that it is more perfect for us to be led by the other than to try to hold everything in our own hands. Folks, none of us can guard that good deposit ourselves. And that work that's begun in you will be seen through to completion with the work of the Holy Spirit. So many elements of life where I want to hold my fists tightly together to, to maintain control over difficult things. And yet this reminder draws me back to the word, draws me back to the grace, that gift of grace, and draws me to open the hand and trust the Holy Spirit to do his magnificent work. Let me pray for you. Father, we're blessed to be back together. And uh, as we hear your word today, I pray that it would be an encouragement. I pray that it would uh, shape our, our habits and our lives uh, even today as we go forth. I thank you for Gordon College and for all these, these people represented here. I pray a blessing over their fall semester as we get started. And uh, that we would honor you and give glory to you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Welcome back.